We're going to start Gog and Magog. We're almost finished. We get through Gog and Magog, 38 and 39. Then we'll start on the temple. It won't be long, but we'll be done with the book of Ezekiel. Everybody's anxious, anxious to get through. Thinking about where you want to go next. What are we going to do next? Um, while y'all turn to Ezekiel 38, I want to read. I want to read uh, some scripture. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by by the effectual working of his power unto me whom am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God God. Now, if we had a man come to us today and said what Paul, if you understand what Paul is saying here, Paul is saying is from the beginning of time until I was born, there was a mystery. There was something hidden from plain sight in all of the scriptures. He's talking about the church. And he said, God has chosen me to make known the mystery that has been hid, he said, from the beginning of time until now. God chose Paul to reveal that mystery to the church, of the church, to the Gentiles. If we had a man come to us and saying, you know, there's, there's some secrets in the Bible that's been hid from the beginning of time, and God has picked me to let you all know what those mysteries, what those secrets are. We wouldn't let him in the sanctuary. We shouldn't let him in the sanctuary because we've got a closed canon. We've got a finished Bible. We've got a done work. There are no new prophecies. There is no Bible 101 or 1.5 or 2.0. It don't work that way. We don't go every year and get an updated version of the Bible because God's Word never changes. But Paul is telling the people just the opposite of that. He says, God chose me to show you something that's been hid from your eyes from the beginning of time until now. And he brought forth and revealed and made manifest the mystery that was the church in the Old Testament. Now, mankind assumes that because Paul made this declaration and wrote the New Testament that all the mysteries of the Bible have been revealed. And there is nothing left in the Bible that's not been revealed. But see, my, my response to that is to be, that is not so. And I'm saying all this before we start Ezekiel 38 and 39 to say this. <clears throat> These two chapters are going to raise more questions than they're going to give you answers. Because when we get through with the invasion or the battle or the war of Gog and Magog, however you want to look at it, there's going to be a lot of questions left, uh, left unanswered. And the answer to that is, nobody really knows. You can read commentaries. You can look. I believe me, I've, I've, I've spent oh, two weeks on the Internet doing this. You can read everybody's idea of what they think. And every man's got a different opinion. Everybody's got a different sequence of events. Everybody's got a different understanding of what this verse says and what that verse says. And instead of, instead of that, we just need to basically take what the Bible says. Understand what Ezekiel 38 and 39 is saying. Because I'm going to go through this list of the, in, in, in chapter 38. The, the first few verses list off names of a bunch of nations, uh, uh, peoples, people groups. 
and you can go and you make and you make conjecture. You can make fairly educated guesses of who these people are. You can go back to the, all of these names that we're going to read are listed in Genesis chapter 10, which is the table of nations. The table of nations being the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth the sons of Noah and how the generations and how the population of the earth spread as they spread out into different areas. And all of these names of these people groups are listed in the table of nations as being grandsons or great grandsons of Noah and his sons. And you can make a pretty educated guess about who they are, but you can't really, that's, that's why I said about that map, that, that map is kind of close, but you can't really say this is for definite sure who these people are, except for Persia. That's as close to a guess as you can get. Persia is Iran, or Elam, or it, it, it's, it's Iran. That, but that's as close as you're going to get. Because, and so what I'm saying is <clears throat> there's a lot of information in these, in these chapters. The first chapter describes, 38, describes the invasion of these people and how this comes about. Chapter 39 which we'll get to next week, Lord willing, is deals with the aftermath after the war is over, after this invasion has happened. Now, it's everybody's guess when this takes place. I mean, there, there's mention in here of seven years, a couple, three times. Everybody just assumes that this happens before the tribulation period starts. Everybody assumes, a lot of people assume that this is the Battle of Armageddon. It could be or it could not be. It's not clear. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's not clear. And, 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 and and for, for my understanding, for all intents and purposes, for, for what I understand, it's written to be that way. Because we can't nail these things down. Because because I've, I've, I've said this many times about about different, all these different opinions and different ideas about end times prophecy. Is nothing, in, it ultimately in the end, after it's all over with, and we can look back on it. I'm sure that a bunch of us is going to stand and say, you know, that really didn't work out like I thought it was going to be. I don't think anything's really going to work out like we think it's going to be. Because we still serve a righteous and holy God, and it's still up to Him, and He wrote it that way. I mean, I mean the, 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 He says, no man knows the hour or the day that I'm coming. Jesus said, only the Father knows. And I promise you, you can study the Bible until your brains come out of your ears. And you're not going to be able to study the Bible enough to figure out. I mean, you can study what it, from whatever aspect you want to. You can, you can, you can start think, looking at, at Bible codes, at numbers, at Jewish calendar. You can look at however you want to look at it. You can, you can do all the math, all the studying you want to, and you're not going to be able to study this book enough to be able to definitely say, Jesus is coming back on this day. It's not going to happen. God designed it to be that way. God understood when these words were written down that men's end. I mean, the, the, the book of Daniel says that knowledge is going to increase. It's going to increase. It's going to expound upon itself. God understood men were going to get smarter and smarter and smarter. Technology and computers and things like that didn't sneak up on God. They, they didn't, he didn't look down here one day and say, man, look what they've invented. I should, have, I should have wrote this down instead of that. It don't happen that way. He knew the knowledge of man as it increased. He knew the intellectual capabilities that man, how far it was going to go. But he also set an end to it. And he said, you can only go this far. So you can study and you can read these things and you can, you can listen to your favorite Bible teacher or your favorite end time, whatever, however you want to look at it. You can come up with, and I hope to goodness, that... that all of this study and what all this studying does is for you. I mean, it, it would it would it would be wonderful if somebody said, "Well, I think I will go back to Genesis chapter 10 and go through the table nations and start chasing that stuff down and go off on your own study," because there is nothing like studying the Bible and personal, personal, all by yourself revelation of truth and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. There's nothing like it. So hopefully, I'm not teaching any of y'all anything, but y'all are taking this as a jump start to say, this is something. I just hope that something I say every week triggers somebody to crack open a book or get on the internet or, or whatever and, 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 and study. Because when it comes right down to it, personal one-on-one, -on -one, your relationship with Jesus Christ 
It's where the fulfillment of all this is going to come. That's where it's going to come from. I mean, we can come to church and, and, and love each other and have a good time while we're here and all that. But really, it's, it's, it's not about me and, me and y'all. It's about me and Jesus or Jesus and me. And he can't, you can't get that without being all by yourself with him, with his word. And if you ask, if you go to digging, if you go to looking, then he's going to lead you down paths and roads and avenues that, never would, that you never imagined. He does it to me all the time. And I hope that what we do here sparks that in you. Now, I, I did not mean to go off on that tangent. So uh, let's go to uh, Ezekiel 38. Now, I'm going to go through this list of uh, names. And everybody get a chance to look at that little map. Um, first of all, we have... Now, and also, I thought this was kind of interesting, too. In, in, in a lot of ancient manuscripts, <clears throat> the Great Wall of China is referred to as the ramparts of Gog and Magog. The end. That's where it comes to an end. The, the Wall of China is referred to that. When it was being built, and I'm talking about ancient times, it was referred to as the ramparts of Gog and Magog. Now, Gog... Is more of a title, just like Herod and Caesar and Pharaoh. So Gog, Gog is the chief prince of Magog, and the chief, Rosh, the son, the son of Rosh, he's also referred to. But now Gog is is here in this invasion that, that Ezekiel's talking about here. But this invasion is before the millennial period. That, that's obvious. Exactly when this takes place it's not all that clear and everybody's got a different idea like I said. But it is before the millennial reign of Christ. It, this happens before the thousand year reign. But at the end of the thousand year reign in Revelation chapter 20, I want to hold your place and turn there real quick. God comes back up in the end of times. In Revelation chapter 20 Starting in verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they, have, they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now this is after, obviously, after the millennial reign. This is after everything is over with. Satan has been bound for a thousand years during the millennial reign. He's loose out of his pit, and he goes out and he gathers up an army. Remember, Jesus has been on earth in his temple, ruling and reigning on this dirt that we live on right here for a thousand years. He's been sitting in his temple. And Satan is loose and still is able at that time to go out and raise an army that's willing to go up against Jesus and fight him on his own turf, on his own territory. So even in the end times, Jerusalem is still a hated city. It's still a sought after and wanted city. Satan still wants to capture the city of Jerusalem and the throne of God, which is there and has been there for a thousand years. So Gog and Magog is referred to in this final battle. And this ain't really a battle. I mean, he goes out, it don't say how long he spends out gathering. It don't say how long it takes him to gather this army up. There's no, there's no word the Bible that says that. They don't give a span of time from the time he comes out of the ground till he shows back up with this army from all the parts of the earth. And he's lapped up with fire. They don't say how long that time is. But it's not really a battle. I mean, they show up back to Jerusalem and God just, they just fires them away. That's it. He's done. He's over with. It's, it's kind of like, okay, that's it. I'm done. Well, it's all over with now because that's when everybody's thrown in the lake of fire. After that, the white throne judgment, that's it. He's done. It's over with. So Gog and Magog is referred to here after the millennial. And it's obvious in Ezekiel 38 
that this is prior to the millennial time. You don't know when. Now my point is that I've said many times that I believe, and again, when it's my opinion, I'll say that this is my opinion, that demons are territorial and geographic in nature. I believe, I truly believe that the same demon that drove Nebuchadnezzar in his day-to-day -day activities is the exact same demon who drives whoever's in charge in Iran and Persia. It's the same demon. It's the same one. It's the same. That's why I'm saying I, I, I look, I see Gog as a, a demon influence. He's the chief prince. Daniel's, Daniel's prayers got interrupted by the chief prince of Persia, who is the same demon, by, by the way, the same demonic influence, because I believe that's the way this works. So I, I look at Gog as the demonic influence that's in charge of Magog. Now, in Amos, well, first of all, in Proverbs chapter 30 and 27, it says this, talking about small things that have great power. It says, the locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. The locusts have no king. That's important. What's that got to do with this? A lot of scriptures we're going to read tonight refer to swarms of locusts. The armies, it refers to armies as swarms of locusts. Now Amos 7, 1 says this, Thus has the Lord God showed me, and behold, a swarm of locusts coming from the east, and behold, one king, Gog. That's in the Septuagint, by the way. It's not in, it's not, it's not in the King James. That's in the Septuagint. So the Bible on one hand says locusts have no king, but on the other hand it describes this band of locusts, this army that Amos sees as being led by a king called Gog, the king of the locusts, the king of the armies. Now... Revelation 9, 1 through 12 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit. And the smoke was a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were crowns of gold, their faces were faces of men, they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stingers in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes hereafter. All the scriptures we're going to read tonight, like I said, are, they have... They have, they have locusts, they have the description of armies as swarms of locusts and men who are over them. And they have kings, they have kings that lead them. All these things are... When we read about horses and horsemen and chariots and spear and bows and arrows, we have to, we have to think in technological terms. We have to think in terms of tanks and jeeps and hummers and missiles and missile launchers and ships. The, the merchants of Tarshish are going to be the navies of the earth. Uh, the, 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 they're not really clear who the, the ship. The ships of Tarshish represent different things in different parts of the Bible. But, but, it, but, it, but it's obvious that the ships are going to be involved in these battles, in this invasion, in this, in this war that's coming. So Gog is a demon king who is king of the armies. He's king of the locusts, the swarms, the locusts. We're going to read more about that in Joel in a little bit. 
Okay, and the land, Magog. We're going to read about Magog. Magog is the Muscovites, or also referred to in history as the Scythians, and it's Russia. It's, it, it, it's Russia for all intents and purposes. Meshach and Tubal. Meshach and Tubal are both cities in Turkey that are on the southern border of the Black Sea, which is in Turkey. Persia, of course, is Iran. It's also referred to as Elam. Ethiopia is Cush. And again, all these names are sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Libya is referred to in a lot of places as Put. It's, it's Libya as we know it today, but it also includes most of North Africa west of Egypt. It, it, it's all of that land there. Gomer. Gomer are the lands, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, East Germany, those, those lands up in there. That's, that's Gomer. That's who Gomer is. Tagarma is Armenia and most of what we know today as Turkey. Sheba and Dedan, which uh, to me are onlookers. They're not involved in this. They're, they're excited that it's going on, but they're not actively involved in this invasion. They're, 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 they're onlookers. But that is Saudi Arabia and Yemen as we know it today. And again, the merchants of Tarshish, not, not really sure. Not, not, not really sure who they're depicting. Um, like I said, they, they depict armies and navies in some places in the Bible. And they, they, depict, they, they haul gold. Uh, Tarshish was... Uh, um, where Jonah bought a ticket to Tarshish and never made it, and never got there. The, the merchants of Tarshish are, are gold, the, the, they're gold and gem, and they're in their navies. They're fighting people. So, all of that being said, <laughs> let's read Ezekiel chapter 38, starting in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So here's the Gog is, is the chief prince of not only Magog, but Tubal and Meshach. All of this area, he's the chief priest of all of these. It's all referred to later on as the northern quarters. In verse 6, he's going to refer to as the northern quarters. And that, and that, 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 that translates out when you go and look at it, translates out as the uttermost northern parts which is even north, north of there. There's no question, really, that this is Russia outside of the fact that because that's what's there. When you look, when you look at the map physically, that's what's up there. So there's not really that much question about that this somehow involves the Scythians or the Muscovites, however you want to look at it, which is, which is Russia. Verse 4, And I will, now this is God speaking now, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. In other words, they don't have any choice whatsoever in what's going on here. God is doing this. He is doing this. This is His will. He is imposing His will on man to get His will done. He's, there's no question that God is in charge of this vast, vast army. If you look at that map and you look at, you think of the armies that 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 that, that and, and and the vast majority of that is, it's Muslims, and you got Russia. Well, just today, just today. Tony Blair, or I guess it was yesterday now, I read about it today. Tony Blair gave a, a, a press conference and said that, <laughs> said that the Western nations of the world are going to have to stand together against Russia and against the Muslim nations. But at the same time, Tony Blair is getting paid by Russia and by the Muslim nations because Tony Blair is now on the pay. He, he gets his check from the world at large. It's kind of a mysterious thing who exactly pays Tony Blair. He's kind of real cryptic when he talks about who he worked for, who, who cuts his check. But, but, but it's, you know, it's part of the EU, it's part of the UN. It's, it's part, because Tony Blair is, ultimate, his, his ultimate job description is he's in charge of world religions. <laughs> I, I don't know who hired him. I'd like to know who, what, what, the head of which denomination hired Tony Blair to be in charge of world religions. I just think it's interesting that all this, this is what we're studying right now, and all this that's going on, because, because we've got a man in Russia right now that is absolutely turning the world upside down, because from, 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 from back, from the 80s on forward, you've got every president standing by watching it today, 
on the video, every one of these presidents is standing up talking about a new world order, a new world order, a new world order, a new world order. Everything's going to be different. Everything, I mean, look, look at how Obama made fun of Mitt Romney when he brought up Russia in, in, in the debates. He almost ran him off the thing. It's in 1985 called, and they, need, they want their ideology back. Because nobody expected this, this bear, this Russian bear. Everybody thought he was dead. Everybody thought this, 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 this bear known as Russia had died off. But now here's this man on the world stage, and we've got, we've got major U.S. news representatives, correspondents, newspaper writers, and TV people talking about the, the, the less than manliness in, in our Obama and our president representing us. Because nobody in this world knows what to do with Putin. Because he has reached out and he has struck a blow that nobody was expecting to happen. Everybody was, we were all getting along. We were all doing so good. And, and, and the last thing on earth that we were all working on was somehow or another we're going to get them Jews and the Palestinians to strike a deal and calm down. And once we get that little conflict down, then we're all okay. And then all of a sudden, here's Putin. Just blows a hole in everybody's end time prophecy. I just think this is outstanding that this that we're, that we're studying this at this time and there's so much going on and there's so much going on in the news that involves Russia. It's just fantastic to me. And I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws and I will bring thee forth and all thine army. Horses, remember these horse, horses, this is anything that you can ride on or in. Again, we, we, we have to look at this from the standpoint of modern technology. Because that's what, that's what this is. These are war machines. This is what their version of war machines were. Horses and chariots and horsemen and riders. But we, we, don't, we don't have chariots and, and horses anymore. We have tanks and jeeps and six bys and trucks and, and railroads. All of these things that we have now. Horses and horsemen. All of them clothed with all sorts of armor. Even a great company with bucklers and shields and all of them handling swords. Again, you got to think weapons, you got to think handguns, you got machine guns, everything you see a soldier dressed out as, dressed out in armor, walking around in bulletproof armor, they're walking around looking non-human. Our, our soldiers are to the point now they don't look like humans walking around. They look like machines. They got, they, I mean, they, they got everything. Verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them. All these nations are with Gog and Magog in this invasion. And just think about just think of all that man. Just think what the size of an army that is coming against Israel. Again, bear in mind, you can put six and a half Israels inside the state of Alabama, and you've got three fourths of the earth coming against them as an army. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all of his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters and all of his bands, and many people with them. Just whoever wants to jump on the party. Come on, just whoever wants to come, come be part of this party. Come on, we're all headed south. We're going to go to Israel, and it's just going to be a big shindig. And you want to come? Come on, just join in. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company there are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now, what that literally means is, be prepared to lead this army. And who's he talking to? Magog, Russia. Be prepared to be out front. Be prepared to be in charge. Be prepared to lead this invading army. Talking to Magog. Verse 8. After many days and in the latter years, now this moves into language that, that we're, we know well and are comfortable with, talking about the end of times, the day of the Lord. He's going to bring, mention that in a few minutes, the day of the Lord. After many days I shall be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, the nation of Israel, the, 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 the land, the land of Israel, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always laid waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now that's key. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. There's another key, a storm. 
Let's think locusts, cloud. We're going to read about clouds here in a minute. Storms. You're going to come like a storm and shall be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all of thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time, now listen to this, this goes along with this invading army. This army decided to come down for spoil. They're coming down for cattle and goods. Now, we read cattle and goods, but you have to think natural gas, oil, military technology, any kind of technology, anything that another country that Israel has that another country wants which is all of those things. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind. Where are they coming from? Who's going to set hooks in their jaws and drag them down there? God. God, again, God is in charge of all of this. He is puppeteering all this, if for lack of a, of, a, of a better word. He's in charge of all this, making all this happen. So he's saying on top of the army aspect, the invasion, the military aspect, these things, these things are going to come into their mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. So it's going to move beyond military takeover. It's going to move beyond this slaughter for a military, for, for the sense of a military. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Now, has anybody in here been to Jerusalem? And Jerusalem is not an unwalled village. There's a wall that goes all the way around Jerusalem. There's walls inside of Jerusalem. The land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest and that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now that's key. Like I said, this is going to raise more questions than it's going to give you answers. Jerusalem has never been an unwalled city, and it's not to this day an unwalled city. And they do not. I mean, there, there's an average of 21 rockets that take off and land on Israel every single day of our existence. It happened. They're not living in safety. They're not living in peace. And they're not living without walls and gates and bars. Now, turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in every lasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, what does that mean? There's that much time in this prophecy allowed till the sin is going to stop. God is going to abolish sin. He's going to do away with sin. And He's going to anoint His most holy. He refers to it in another place as, I'm going to set my glory in Jerusalem. He's going to build Him a temple. Jesus is going to live there for a thousand years. And Daniel's talking about this. That at the end of this prophecy, this is going to happen. Know therefore and understand, verse 25, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah, Jesus, will be cut off. He'll be slaughtered. He'll be killed. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant for many, for with many for one week. Seven years. And in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he shall cause, he to be an antichrist, he shall cause the oblation to cease shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's how we know that when he takes when he takes over the temple, there's going to be a temple there. The temple's going to be rebuilt. That's why we're looking for the rebuilding of the temple right now. 
watching it. They're demanding it. You got Jews marching on the Temple Mount every single day, demanding that something be done about the Temple Mount, about the Waf, and about the Muslims who throw rocks at them. They want to build their temple. They're anxious. They want. They've been without it all this time, and they want their temple back. And we know they're going to get it back because right here it says he's going to want the he's going to walk in and take over the temple and declare himself God. Paul says in Thessalonians, he's going to declare himself God. In the, end, in the midst of one week, he shall the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, He's going to make war. The Antichrist is going to set himself up in Jerusalem in a temple that's not there yet. But up until that time, there's going to be relative peace. But they're still going to be living in a walled city. They're still going to be living in a place where there's nothing exists unless it's behind walls. Now, go to Zechariah chapter 2. Because Zechariah chapter 2 talks about Jerusalem being at peace in an unwalled city. Zechariah chapter 2. I lifted up my eyes again, and I looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, and speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, for the multitude of men and the cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. That's Jesus living in Jerusalem, being the walls. God said, I'll be their walls. They're going to be living in peace, and I'm going to be their walls. But it's when Jesus is there. It's when Jesus is there. So we just read about in Revelation about an invading army that's led by a locust king, by, led by Satan, who comes out and he goes all over the earth and he gets up a battle array to come back to Jerusalem while Jesus is sitting on the throne. Now, in verse 12 of Ezekiel 38, it plainly says that these people are coming to invade a city that lives in peace and safety without walls. So does that mean that this is the battle of Armageddon? Does that mean this happens before the tribulation happens? Does it mean it happens after the tribulation happens? Does it mean it happens at the end of the millennial reign when this invasion comes about? It depends on how mad you, how bad you want to mess up your end time prophetic ideas in your head, how you look at this. Because Jerusalem has never lived as in a city with no walls in peace and safety, and they never will until the Messiah comes at the beginning of the millennial reign and sets up in his temple where the Bible says he'll be forevermore, forever and ever, forevermore. Verse 13, back in Ezekiel chapter 38. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, or Saudi Arabia, and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions, those young lions are princes and rulers, Thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, verse 14, prophesy and say unto God, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, again, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud. Again, there's that cloud. Just think swarm. Think local. Everybody have seen this local swarm? Even a video on YouTube or anything of a local swarm? Anyway. As a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days, again, in the latter days, always refers to the end times, the day, of, the day of the Lord, the day of Jacob's trouble, and I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me. 
when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now, turn to Joel, the book of Joel. Because Joel speaks kind of the same thing. Joel talks about a locust army. In Joel chapter 2, verse 20, we're going to get back to it, and I want to read it first. God tells the nation of Israel, He says, But I will remove far off from you that northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up. His stink is going to be important more so next week than now. His stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Now back in chapter 1. This northern army. Look in uh, Joel. Uh, well let's just read the first four verses in, in chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Joel the son of Pethuel. Hear this ye old men. And give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Joel's starting us out, and he's saying, I'm fixing to describe something to you that has never happened before. And if you'll think about it, you'll know that this has never happened in the days of your fathers. Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, that which the palmer worm, palmer worm, has left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the cankerworm eaten. And that which the cankerworm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Now what Joel's saying there is that if the devastation is going to be so great that one set of bugs is going to come through and they're going to eat what they can and leave and another set of bugs is going to come back and eat what those bugs couldn't leave couldn't get to and then yet another and then what he's saying is the desolation is going to be so bad it's going to be such a waste that you can't imagine this that's what he's saying this has never happened in your days or the days of your fathers and it's so important that you need to tell your children about it you need to tell your children's children about it and they need to tell generations to come after that because this is coming on your land he's saying now look at chapter 2 starting in verse 1 blow ye the trumpet in zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like. Neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them is a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. It's describing an army. Now we move, we, we, he described them as bugs, but he's talking about an army, this great army that's coming. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and his horsemen. So shall they run, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the, stru the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their pa the face the people shall be much pained, all the faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Nothing is going to stop this army. Nothing is going to stop them. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded. They're going to be covered in so much armor. They shall run to and fro in the city and they shall run upon the wall. They shall climb again. There's the wall. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, where else in the Bible do you see the sun and the moon and the stars go away? In the book of Revelation and in Matthew 24. Jesus says the sun and the moon is going to go dark 
and the stars are going to fall out of the sky. He says it in the Gospels, and he says it in the book of Revelation. And Joel says it right here. So is Joel talking about the exact same thing? I'll leave it for you to decide. You study and decide on your own. As far as my opinion, as far as what I think, when the sun and the moon and the stars fall out of the sky, that's only going to happen one time. I don't think God's going to do that over and over again for a showcase for us to ooh and ah over and say, boy, that was cool, do it again. It's only going to happen one time. So in my opinion, when the Bible, when Joel talks about the stars and the moon and the sun falling out of the sky, when Isaiah talks about the same thing, when Ezekiel talks about the same thing, when Jesus talks about the same thing in the Gospels, and when John talks about it in the book of Revelation, I'm of the high opinion that that's all the same. They're all talking about the exact same thing, the exact same event. And the Lord shall utter His voice. Listen to this. Listen to what happens after this. And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sanctify a fast, and call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy inheritance to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more, no more make you a reproach among the heathen. No more. He only makes that promise to them one time. I will no more make you a reproach, but I will remove far off from you this northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and, Ill, and, and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. He's going to take care of them. He's going to take care of his people. His people can repent. There's always room for repenting repentance. There's always room to turn from your evil, wicked ways. Now, he says in the book of Revelation that, that some men won't. They're not going to. They're going to defy him. They're going to rebel against him. But ultimately, the things that we're going to go through from now until the end days, until the end times, until we all walk in peace and safety together with him in the millennial when he's here reigning, the things that we're going to go to are designed for just that, to turn men's hearts away from their evil, wicked ways and to bring them back to God, to bring his nation, Israel, is to bring his nation back unto him. Zechariah 14 mentions the same thing. Verses 1 through 3, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations, every one of them, against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day. In that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. 
and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains. All of these things are talking about the same events. They're describing the same events that are in our very, very near future. These things that are coming. All through the book of Ezekiel, God has used the prophecies against Israel to show us today, to point out to us today, to bring redemption to us today through the revelation of the things that are coming. Because there is not a wasted word in the Bible anywhere. None of them are there for no reason. None of them. They all connect. They all allude to each other. They all build on each other. It is the established everlasting Word of God. And we may look at the Old Testament and things that are in there as dusty and tired and old, but the revelation of Jesus too, that I was talking about at the beginning, the revelation that He comes to you with, the, 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 the relationship that He brings to that, to you and Him personally, that's what, that's what the end of all this is. That's where the joy comes from that He says He leaves with us, not the joy that the world gives you. The joy can give you. I mean, the world can give you joy, but it's temporary. It goes away. It rusts and rots, and, and it falls apart, and it breaks down, and it tears up. His joy don't. And even in the midst of all the things that are going on in our generation, we can look even back in the old, dead, tired Old Testament. And we can see where it speaks of Jesus and Jesus wanting us to fellowship with him each and every day. That's what it's about. That's what it's for. That's why we had that's why he gave us this word. That's why he gave it all. If it was all just about getting saved and going to heaven, then everybody would the Bible would be a chick track. I mean, seriously, if it was just about if it's just about giving your heart to Jesus and, and, and going to heaven when you die, the whole the whole gospel. I mean, the, the, look at the Roman road. You could put all that in a in a in a in a little piece of paper. The Roman road to heaven. This whole entire word of God is given to us for daily replenishment and daily enjoyment and daily fellowship with Him because it's all His Word. The Bible says that there's three that bears record in heaven, the Father and the Word. It's all Jesus. It's not, he's not just in the red letters. It's all. It's all Him. He wrote it all. He is it all. It's all about Him. Nothing in here is wasted. Nothing is thrown away. Nothing is here for entertainment. Nothing. It's all connected. It all stands together. Back in Ezekiel 38, verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, at his presence. At his presence, get that, they'll shake at his presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Everything is going to be lowered. Jerusalem is going to be the highest point on the face of the whole earth after it's all over and done with. Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, is the only thing that's going to be left. That's going to be the highest place on earth. Verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all of my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus, verse 23, Will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That's why he's doing it. 
to magnify itself, to sanctify itself, to turn his people back to him so that the heathen nations will know who he is, that he is the Lord. There is only one Lord. There's only one God. That God's not Buddha, it's not Christian, it's not Allah, it's not any of those false gods, it's not in any any of those elephants or anything from anywhere on the face of the earth. There's only one God. There's only one God and there's only one way to get to Him and to stay away from this right here. And that's the blood of His Son, Christ Jesus. Any questions or comments? Next week, we'll deal with the aftermath of what happens in this, uh, chapter 39. Then after that, we'll start on the temple, and hopefully it won't be too long, we'll be out of the book of Ezekiel. So, you know, start thinking about what you want to study next, or do you want to study anything next, or do you want to teach the next class?